Good afternoon. I'm Bruce Hawkins, Sr., the uh, guardianship social worker here at uh, uh, Broughton Hospital. And I want to talk with you this afternoon about my experience growing up black in the segregated South, Burke County. On April 12, 1943, I was born at Grace Hospital on a segregated hall which was designated for colored only. I was one of five boys at the time which eventually emerged to seven boys. This was the beginning of my growing up in a segregated Burke County. I will attempt to use a timeline from 1943 to 1977. From 1943 to 1949, my family was somewhat isolated and I can't remember much that period of time other than the typical childhood type of things which were limited to my neighborhood. A number of factors played into our ability to move beyond the boundaries of my neighborhood. The primary factors were that we were poor and we were denied access to the limited public facilities at that time. The nearest movie theater that would allow admission to blacks was in Morganton and we were only allowed admission upstairs in the back of the area which was designated colored only. Job opportunities for blacks were limited as my mother worked as a domestic worker and my dad as a gas station attendant. In 1949, I entered Drexel Colored School, which was one of four elementary schools for black Burke County students. These schools were supposedly separate but equal. Yes, I can assure you that they were separate but not equal. Equal was not being provided textbooks that were damaged with missing pages and sitting at desks that were used and damaged. Our recreational equipment was very limited. We played basketball on a red clay court for a number of years, but was later upgraded to asphalt. Also, for a number of years, we did not have a cafeteria nor indoor plumbing. There were eight grades with three teachers and three classrooms with one teacher sharing the responsibility as principal. Probably at the age of 12 and 13, I can remember my family venturing outside of my community more, but limited to attending the fair and local baseball games as my father played for the American Legion team. The year 1955 stands out as the year that I really began to realize the struggles of black Americans, especially in the South. The year 1955 was the year Emmett Till, a young black boy, was murdered by a white mob in Mississippi, accused of flirting with a white woman. Also, this was the year of the Montgomery bus boycott when a lady by the name of Rosie Parks refused to give up her seat on the bus to a white man and the year that the late Dr. Martin Luther King emerged and the civil rights movement began. At the age of 14 and a rising high school freshman, I had the opportunity to travel by bus to a boys camp in eastern North Carolina. Upon aboarding the bus, my friend and I were told that we had to take a seat in the back. Being a young boy and very timid, I immediately went to the back. Today, I wondered what would have been the consequences if I refused to do so. In 1957, that was the year that I entered Olive Hill High School in Morganton, which was the high school for blacks in Burke County. This was another school that was separate but equal. Yes, I enjoyed my high school experience, but wondered today what it would have been like to attend Drexel High School, which was a short distance from my home. 
It would certainly have been better than riding a bus for eight to ten miles one way, five days a week. Although resources were limited, Olive Hill High School prepared its graduates to compete academically with other students in colleges and universities. In 1965, Olive Hill High School was closed due, due to desegregation. Throughout my high school career, the Jim Crow segregation laws continued to impact me as far as access to public facilities. There were a number of facilities that would not allow services to blacks, or if so, only entry by way of the back door to the kitchen area. There were no summer jobs and recreational facilities were very limited. Signs that read white only were very evident in the county, even at a water fountain at our county courthouse. Restaurants would employ black cooks and busboys, but deny them the right to eat in the dining room. Laundromats had signs posted, white only. One in particular with a store next door where blacks were allowed to shop for, to purchase gas. Several weeks prior to graduation, like most high school seniors, we were looking for excitement and decided to go to one of the drive-in restaurants, knowing that we would not be served. Upon parking, a waitress came to our vehicle and announced that they did not serve colors. Our response was, we do not want to order colors, we want to order a hamburger. A little humor helped the situation at the time. I graduated from Olive Hill High School in 1961 and entered the workforce as I had no aspirations to attend college and I knew my parents could not afford to send me. While working for 87 cents an hour in the housekeeping department at Valdez General Hospital and after much encouragement to attend college from a friend whom I worked for while in school, he assured me that he would help me to obtain a student loan from one of the local banks. I applied for admission to North Carolina A&T State University in Greensboro, North Carolina and was accepted. In September 1962, with my bags packed, I went on my way to a new beginning. On our travel to Greensboro, my dad stopped in a small town to gas up, and once again we were greeted with signs on the restroom doors that read, Colored Boys and Colored Girls. 1962 was two years after the sit-in movement began and was continuing. I immediately became involved in the movement along with other students. We marched almost every afternoon along with Jesse Jackson, who was president of our student government. Yes, we were arrested by the Greensboro Police Department for requesting services at the Woolworth Snack Bar and seeking admission to the local movie theaters. One afternoon, while attempting to gain admission to one of the local theaters, two students one male and one female with similarities to whites proceeded ahead of us and purchased tickets. Upon the arrival of the remaining students, they met us at the door and told management that they were black and you allowed us in, why not them? Management didn't have to answer as we realized then and there that we were being discriminated against because of the pigmentation of our skin. With the passage of the Civil Rights Act in 1965, which prohibited discrimination against blacks, most schools were desegregated and all public facilities reluctantly provided services to blacks. Upon graduating in 1966 and gaining employment, with the Burke County school system as a home school counselor, I returned to Burke County. When visiting several of our local high schools, I was greeted with racial slurs 
which were dealt with by the superintendent. Eventually, I left the school system and gained employment in the social work department here at Broughton Hospital. After being employed here for approximately two years, a supervisor's position became available and I was asked to accept it by our social work director. When another administrator heard that I was filling the position, he told my supervisor that it was not time for a colored to become a supervisor. That was in 1970. My supervisor did what was right and gave me the position knowing that I was qualified. Over the years, race relations improved without any major incidents in Burke County. Because of my experience with segregation and racism, I am a stronger person. I am not bitter. Although the wound has healed, the scar is still there. I have been inspired to take a stand against racism, oppression, and poverty. In Dr. Martin Luther King's speech, I have a dream. He echoed my thoughts that went back to 1962 at the door of the theater in Greensboro, North Carolina. Help this country to realize that people should not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character.